Hi, we continue in Luke 23 today after Jesus has told the person on the cross next to him, today you will be with me in paradise and now darkness descends over the land. So as you can see on the right side of the screen, we've been going through this structure of shape, uh, the shape of Luke 22 and 23, and now we're down to this section here, the end of this little chiasm, uh, really not that little chiasm that you can see here from the taking of Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross down to the end. And we can see that our section today here is parallel to the first section. There was a man and a group of women, the daughters of Jerusalem, and now there's a man, the centurion, and the women from Galilee. And Beyond our chiasm, beyond the crucifixion, we'll see in the burial, there's another man and a group of women. So we see how Luke continues that pattern here. Uh, and now we're on this section here, where this B, um, B1 part of the chiasm is parallel up here, where Jesus referred to God as Father, and there's a div dividing of, of, of a material here, of the clothing here, and of the curtain of the temple there. So that's where we're on here. And so I'll just leave that up as we go right through our passage. Uh, and as we begin, we're going to note that what we're going to look at here is some of the cultural contrast between elite Romans and ordinary people that is oddly parallel to the kind of uh, division that's going on in the society I'm in in the United States and in many Western societies today between the intellectual elite and science on the one hand and the views of ordinary people who are not exposed to science and have distrusted the elites and their expertise on the other hand. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So the narrator begins right away with it was about noon and darkness came over the whole land, but doesn't explain it. It doesn't say it's an eclipse and ultimately does not say it's an eclipse. But before we look at what Luke does say, let's look at how it's contrasted and parallel with what we see in Mark and Matthew. I've been highlighting throughout this section that in many ways Mark, Matthew, and Luke are not synoptic when it comes to the Passion. Luke's version is almost completely different as we've been seeing. The parts that are in bold here are the parts that are unique to Luke, whereas Matthew in the green here has things that are common to Mark that are not in Luke, and the parts that are in plain type are the parts that are common to all three, or in some cases to all four. And here we do have what's common to all three is noon, at noon till three there is darkness. We see it here in Mark, we see it in Matthew, and we see it here in Luke. But what Mark and Matthew have that Luke clearly leaves out is the cry in Aramaic then translated into Greek in the text in English for us from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the uh, bystanders wondering whether he's calling upon Elijah, etc. as you see here. Uh, and that's not there. And why Luke leaves it out, it's hard to argue from silence. But he shows Jesus completely um, in control of the situation here. And although, as we've looked for Brittany Wilson's excellent work, it's not that he's dying a manly death. Everything about his death and everything about his passion is unmanly, from his being naked to his being humiliated, etc. But he's not showing that he has lack of faith in God. And that's the key difference here. For whatever reasons, Mark and Matthew think it's important to show Jesus struggling uh, with his trust in God at this moment, Luke does not do that. In fact, we had just seen him in the previous scene being so self-assured and assured in God that he could tell the person next to him that today you would be with me in paradise. But we don't hear that here. Uh, and what we'll also see is the spectacle, the word for spectacle here, and that's important for Luke's Roman audience, uh, as we'll see. So with that in mind, let's look not just at what Luke doesn't say, but what he does say. Uh, so about noon is the sixth hour, and all the times are in terms of hours. Three in the afternoon, as you can see, here is the ninth hour. And it's possible at least to wonder whether the sixth hour, the only other uses of sixth in Luke's Gospel, or the sixth month of Elizabeth back here. And so is there supposed to be some uh, recollection there of the contrast between the sixth hour that was leading to life and the sixth hour of darkness that leads to death? We've already seen quite a number of echoes of the first chapters and to the end here, including the bright hope that we saw at the beginning that at least in the way that people expected it, that he would inherit the kingdom of his father David and perhaps be that kind of Messiah has certainly been dashed. And the sense that it's been dashed will continue all the way into chapter 24 when the two on the road to Emmaus say to the risen Jesus, not knowing it's him, are you the only one who doesn't know what's happening? Uh, how we had been hoping that he would be the one. Um, but seemingly their hope is dashed. And we'll see the same thing in the beginning of Acts, that even after the resurrection, there's the question, is now the time you're going to return the kingdom to Israel? And so there's a real split there, um, we'll see. And so a lot of the, the disorientation, the darkness here, is because the disciples have not learned how to read Scripture. And in chapter 24, Jesus will teach them how to do that. And we'll see that echoed as well in Acts. So it was about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land. And the fact that it's there for three hours clearly highlights that it's not an eclipse. 
Eclipses only last for a few minutes, and even <clears throat> the broad part of an eclipse doesn't last for three hours. Let's look a little more at the language before we try to understand what Luke's trying to convey. So it came over the whole land, literally all the earth here, uh, which of course would be impossible, but it's trying to highlight this is not just a natural thing. Uh, until the uh, ninth hour. And then here the translation is missing, leaving something out or maybe putting something in that's not there. No RSV has, well, the sun's light failed. But there's no light there. Really, it's the sun that itself failed. Uh, and as my note below has, Romans believe that during an eclipse, Apollo, the sun charioteer, who you can see here, was either displeased with the mortal realm or engaged in celestial battles, temporarily obscured by the shadow of conflict. This period of darkness was a time of reflection and appeasement for the Romans who sought to understand and mitigate the gods' warnings. But what that same author goes on to note is that elites like the Stoic philosopher Seneca quote, posits that eclipses were considered omens only due to a misunderstanding of natural laws by those uneducated in scientific principles. And so what we can see from this article by Richard Carrier, uh, a scholar who spent a lot on this, as he notes here and he explicates in his article, we find the eclipse in ancient sources as omen, as astrological portent, and as the outcome of diabolical magic, but also as a natural phenomenon scientifically understood. But though the superstitions can be found on both sides of the literacy divide, a scientific understanding of the eclipse seems never to have spread beyond the literate elite, as they represent a tiny minority of the population even within cities. And what he goes on to show in that article is how the so-called rational principle, the idea that one can look out at the phenomenon in the world and think calmly through it and try to figure out an explanation based on data, obviously not modern science, but certainly a sense that the Enlightenment recaptured in the 17th and 18th centuries, that the human mind was capable of engaging in observations and thought that could explain natural phenomena. But then, as and now, the ordinary people are often suspicious of the elite and their intellectual acumen as something to be used as power over against them, as it so often is. So the elite had often disdain for the ordinary people and their supposed superstitions and their belief in the gods. Um, and the ordinary people had disdain for the elite and their feelings of superiority. And in later centuries, as many Roman histo modern historians of the Roman Empire have noted, uh, even the elite tended to cover over their disdain and act like they believe in the gods, at least to maintain popular uh, approval among ordinary people, much like many of the elite who don't believe in God go to church or quote God or quote the Bible and things like that to appease Christian evangelicals who want their leaders to at least have some belief uh, or at least a sensible belief in God. So it's a very similar to the vibe we see now. And what does that say for Luke's audience? Well, Luke is writing to um, ordinary people, but who are being educated in Paideia. As I've been noting throughout, Luke uses a large vocabulary, much larger than any of the other gospel writers, and using many words that are unique in the New Testament, if not unique in the Bible, to appeal to the intellectual ability of his educated elite that he's writing for them and not for um, people who can't, aren't capable of understanding that kind of language. So plainly, what they would are being called to understand here, that this is neither a, a natural phenomenon that people like Seneca could map out the data of, although it's interesting that scholars of ancient eclipse lore note that the Romans were actually had weak data compared to um, better uh, scientifically oriented kingdoms like the Babylonians and others, including the Mayans. Um, but at least they were trying to do that. And so for Luke's audience, they know an eclipse does not last three hours and they don't believe in Apollo. So what Luke is trying to suggest without saying it is this is a phenomenon by God. That it's not just a natural phenomenon but something that's happening in this moment uh, apart from what you can observe about eclipses because it's the fact that it's lasting for three hours and is covering at least in his language the whole earth indicates this is a divine intervention in the situation. And in addition to that, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And notice there's no causation given here. It doesn't say that God did it. It's in the passive voice, both in the Greek and the English. The sun, well, the sun failed is positive there, but it's not saying why it happened. And the curtain of the temple was torn. There's the, po the passive voice there without saying how that happened. Let's look a little more closely at the second half of this, having explored the, uh, the element of the, um, the curtain there. And I'll put our 
my keywords back up here. So the word for the curtain of the temple here, katapetsasma here, is taken from Mark, and it's also parallel in Matthew. It's originally, of course, from Exodus, where the description of what is required to make the curtain of the temple is put out in great detail. So of 38 times that the word is used in the Septuagint, 33 of them are in Exodus in Numbers. Um, as Green notes, it's a notoriously difficult phrase, and he suggests does not symbolize the destruction of the temple. What is signified is God's turning away from the temple. But I'd like to suggest something else based on the language that he provides here. It's not that the temple has gone dark or failed like the sun. The sun failing is appealing to the Roman sense that the gods are on their side, at least in the, in the ordinary sense of that within the mythology. Here, this is obviously appealing to the, the Jewish audience, or at least those who are trying to honor um, that tradition. Uh, the interesting, the temple, word for temple here now is only in chapter 1 apart from this, which really does lead a little extra bit of credence to the possibility that the sixth hour here is meant to echo the, the sixth month for Elizabeth um, back in chapter 1. Um, but the temple is only mentioned here, will be mentioned twice in Acts, and it says the curtain of the temple was torn in two, um, using the word schism, which is used in um, other places for the symbol of division between people. Let's see how that plays out, the schism in Acts 14 4, the residents of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews or Judeans, if you will, and some with the apostles. And we see similarly here near the end of Acts, when Paul said this, a dissension began between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. And so we can see that the symbolism here is of not just the temple uh, being destroyed, which doesn't say it's happening, although it does obviously happen in the Roman destruction a generation after Jesus' crucifixion, but the division. And to highlight that, I'd like to, to note here this little chart of unity and division in Luke's passion story. And the green parts are about unity and the red parts are about division. And so I'd like to go through these so we can see what is really being said here. So although it's a division here, it's clearly a symbol of unity, taking the cup and dividing among themselves to have the unity among Jesus' followers. But right after that is the division amongst themselves about who's the greatest. And we see here the division that Satan would like. I didn't have a specific word here, but I could have highlighted sift, to sift out who is with Jesus and who is with Satan. And then Peter shows himself on the other side. You're one of them, but he's not. So he's divided there. But then we see all the unity of Jesus' opponents. And I've been highlighting this all the way through. I won't run through all those. You can see all the unity of the opponents there. And then the, the uh, division here of his clothes in our scene and the division of the temple. And then after this in our scene that we're going to look at, all the crowds who gathered for the spectacle, united, and all his acquaintances or those who knew him standing at a distance. And finally, the division in the last scene um, is the division between Joseph and the council he did not agree to their plan. So what we're seeing is not so much that the temple is, divide, um, the temple is destroyed or rejected by God, but it's no longer a symbol of unity. Um, that that Jewish people or Yahweh's people, if you will, are divided between those who take up Jesus' message, what I call the religion of creation, and those who side with the Roman and uh, Sanhedrin collaboration um, and take up the religion of empire. And the temple can no longer be a symbol of unity for those people. And so with, those, with that expressed that the symbol of, of Roman power, of Apollo, if you will, and of the temple are both failing here, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, and we've seen loud voices throughout Luke uh, many times, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And what we're seeing here is yet another psalm echo. From right here, from Psalm 31.5, this is the fourth psalm we've seen. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And it's interesting that Luke has so many uh, senses of the Psalms here without saying it. We'll see in the Road to Emmaus story where the Psalms are named out loud as part of what Jesus teaches them to understand what's going on. So into your hands I commend my spirit, or literally set it before you, as my note below has, a word usually used for setting food before another, linked with the bread uh, before the crowd. So he hands his spirit over to God, and having said this, he breathes his last, which is all one word, and it's exactly as in Mark, not elsewhere in the Bible. And it's with no crying and with no complaint, and he's just handing it all over. And now, now that he's dead, we hear there's a Roman centurion standing there, which shouldn't surprise us, but the response is surprising at several levels. So we'll continue through verses 47 to 49 to see these responses before um, we go to the next scene in the next video around the burial. So the centurion that we've seen earlier in chapter 7, one who loved our people, they were, he was, Jesus was told, and helped build their synagogue, anticipated 
anticipating the centurion in Acts 10 uh, that will unite a Jew and the nations together in Jesus. As Whitaker notes in an excellent piece on this scene, sees the crucifixion as a spectacle, which is the word we see here in verse 48, as if staged for the amphitheater, and therefore sees a centurion as reflecting the Roman privilege to have a front row seat at the spectacle. And so we saw, when he saw what was taking place, he praised or literally glorified God, which is an odd thing for a Roman centurion in a public place to do, saying, certainly or truly, this man not innocent, but was righteous, exactly matching Joseph of Arimathea. We'll see righteous down here. Why it's translated innocent here and righteous here is impossible to know it's the same word. So he declares Jesus righteous, highlighting yet again uh, that uh, he's not the, the scapegoat that which people can put their sins because he doesn't have any sins or anything done wrong that his expulsion and his death can purify the nation of. Uh, so the scapegoat mechanism has failed uh, to accomplish its purpose here of uniting people, hence the division of the curtain into two. And so all the crowds, and this is the first we're hearing about them, that there were crowds here. And notice the, the unity of crowds. It's hard to know what one crowd is for another, but Luke is highlighting the unity here. Of all the crowds who had gathered for the spectacle, and that's the key point here. Uh, they're not gathering about Jesus. They're not gathering uh, about um, caring about the, the Roman Empire and its collaboration with the Sanhedrin. They're gathering for the spectacle, like people gathering for a lynching or people gathering um, around the, the Spanish Inquisition for someone to be burned at the cross, as Dostoevsky shows so powerfully in the Brothers Karamazov. So they're there for the entertainment. Uh, and as Whitaker again notes below, um, this is in terms of the spectacle of death. And as he says, in specifying Jesus' death as a theoria, that's the word as you can see here, Luke places it in the context of a wide array of ancient visual activities ranging from athletic contests to the theater, from festivals to political religious activities such as visiting sacred sites or consulting an oracle. And I'd already shown in the previous video uh, how it was clear that Pilate saw crucifixion as a means to draw people's attention to you don't want to do this and that people would gather for it. So certainly people gathering for the spectacle aren't expecting they would ever be subject to it, but they're just there in awe of the power of the empire to control life in that way. So when they saw it, they returned home. As Whitaker notes again below, their movement homeward reinforces that no more pleasure is to be had at the spectacle, or rather that this spectacle of death no longer holds pleasure for them. Um, and he notes that to express or show grief at such an event was a sign of, quote, being weak. Um, and he adds below that Emperors Gaius, Nero, Domitian, and Tiberius were all known for watching the crowd for the appropriate response at games and festivals. Gaius and Domitian in particular were renowned for having spectators dragged away if they failed to show the requisite level of enthusiasm. So perhaps that's what's being done here. Being the breast is normally seen as an expression of mourning. I noted earlier in 2327 when the new RSV describes the daughters of Jerusalem beating their breasts that that's not literally what it says. It's more like they were weeping and wailing. But here the phrase literally is that they're beating their breasts. And whether that's as mourning or wow we really saw something is hard to say. But in contrast with the crowd gathered for the spectacle we see all those who knew him which is yet another psalm uh, echo as we can see here. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances, those who see me in the street flee from me. Um, and so we see them not fleeing but standing at a distance. And notice it says including the women. So all those who knew him, as you can see, uh, Ganostoi here, those who knew him only back in 244, earlier in Luke, another echo back to the ch early chapters, but including the women. So it's suggesting those who knew him are more than just the women. Who the rest of those are, we don't know. Um, it's, it can't be the Anna and Simeon people because they weren't from Galilee. They were in Jerusalem all along. So we don't know who the others who might have followed from Galilee are. Perhaps that just refers to the disciples and they're being referred to that way, but it's hard to know because only the women are named. Um, clearly the others need to be men. There's no word for other genders in this context. Um, so whether that's the disciples or other men, we don't know. The word for following here is following with. It's, the, it's a unity word for discipleship. And that they're following from Galilee contrasts the daughters of Jerusalem. And so at the beginning, daughters of Jerusalem are, are told to mourn for their future, uh, for their children. And now these women from Galilee are staying at a distance watching these things. Hara'o there, and we've seen that a number of times, and we'll see it some more. So, um, uh, and that's where we'll end it for today before we get to Joseph, another man with the same group of women uh, planning for the burial. But we'll pick that up next time. See you then.